Okay, so if I can just give you a quick overview then of, of this first session, uh, which is going to be about 45 minutes long. Um, I'd like to start really by talking about uh, identifying the core risks to developing a product. Uh, new product development is inherently risky. Uh, as a company, we work very hard to minimise those risks, um, and we've developed a bit of a strategy uh, actually very early on in, in the development cycle to look at that and identify core risks and, and then tackle some of those. So um, that's the first <coughs> two sections of this talk are going to be about that. Uh, once we've covered that, then we'll move on to um, smart product development, uh, which will basically go through our kind of prototyping process that, that I've refined through being in this industry for about kind of eight or nine years now. Uh, and then finally, we'll touch on the, the value of good product design, some of which will probably be obvious to you, um, some of which uh, hopefully will be slightly less obvious. Um, so just quickly, uh, I'll skip through this relatively rapidly. Um, this is me, obviously. Um, as I said, Managing Director of D2M. I originally qualified as an industrial designer from Loughborough University. Um, and then my, I guess my real kind of industry training was working for a diving firm down in Cornwall. Um, and the key thing really that I picked up from that was that I was doing the design work at the front end, but everyone else involved in the process was working in the same building through to tool makers. They were still doing injection molding actually in a factory in Cornwall. Um, so literally what I designed at the beginning of the process, if there was any kind of major issues with it, I was going to get it in the neck from someone kind of four months down the line who actually had to make the tool to mold it, um, or even the molder who was then using that tool to mold the parts. Um, and the, the I guess one of the great things about the, the diving company was that we were doing textile work for the kind of BCD diving jackets and things and also plastic mouldings, metal machining and everything else. So that, that gave me quite a wide overview to the, the whole development process. Um, and even actually beyond that to the fact that the kind of marketing director sat two desks down from me. Um, and obviously then if we developed the wrong product that wasn't appealing to the market, he was going to have something to say as well. So I think that that kind of positioned me quite uniquely to, as a kind of complete, cohesive overview to the whole process. And that's something then that I've taken forward into the, the company that, that I run. Um, and also hopefully gives me something to say this morning that, that may be of, of use to, to you all. Um, so without further ado, let's crack on then with the, with the first bit. Um, so I think probably over the last eight or nine years, I've supervised or personally designed about a thousand products. Um, not all of those are on the market, um, and in fact, probably more than 50% aren't. Um, and one of the things that, that I've been doing, particularly over the last kind of three, four years, uh, is refining the process at the beginning before any work is actually done to ensure that risk is minimised, that the key risks to a project are identified clearly, and that a development strategy is put in place to ensure that they're looked at early on. So we'd far rather drop a product totally three or four stages in, maybe having spent three or four thousand pounds, as opposed to getting all the way through um, you know, second, third stage prototypes, only to find that there's some inherent problem with it why it wasn't going to get to market. Um, it seems obviously like common sense, but I'm always hugely surprised uh, how this generally isn't, isn't done by agencies or by in-house product design teams. Um, so this is some of the key risks uh, that that face a product. Um, obviously, these are fairly general. There may be other specific ones to a, to a specific product that you're developing. Um, and we'll just run through them quickly. And then what I'm going to do is talk about some of the strategies that we've developed to minimize some of these risks and, uh, and review them. Uh, so IP infringement, uh, obviously kind of a key risk that you launch a product and then you actually find that someone's coming after you because you're infringing their patent. I'm not going to touch too much on that, hence it being in italics, um, and that's something obviously that, that Vicky hopefully will touch on, or failing that you can always ask her about uh, in the break. Um, second risk is, is a risk that faces any product really. Uh, will anyone buy it? Um, and there's obviously a lot that you can do to try and assess that before you get to launch, um, and we'll go through some of those things that you can do uh, in the next part of this talk. Um, specification creep uh, is a key risk. And so to give you an example, really, we've been working with a dentist on a medical product now for about three and a half years. Uh, we're on something like Mark 5 or 6 prototype. Uh, and to be honest, Mark 3 prototype would have been fine to launch as a product. Um, and in fact, he did launch it at a show, um, and it got some very good feedback. Um, but unfortunately, at that point, changed his mind on how he wanted to do things. Uh, so kind of the specification creaked. Um, and as a result, went through further prototyping. 
But in the six months after that show, one of his competitors launched a product that had the kind of key innov innovation that, that he had in it. Um, and I, I guess the point I wanted to kind of make from that example really is that actually he could have launched that Mark III product then and there. He would have been having sales, obviously, getting some uh, value out of the development work done so far. And then all the changes that he's come up with, they're all worthwhile and, and valid changes, could have gone into a Mark II, potentially a Mark III product, um, and therefore obviously had a lot more value out of all of that. Um, and I think that is a, a kind of key risk um, to developing a, a product. And we find it particularly with our uh, kind of entrepreneurs, startup people that we're working with, um, that actually their kind of personal feeling about the product comes into it too much. And actually if it's, and it would have been if we'd launched that product earlier, it would have still been a market leading product, it would have still been highly innovative. Um, it just wouldn't have been quite as refined in the way that we've, we've now refined it. Um, so I think that's probably a, a kind of key risk facing products. Um, Obviously, product unit cost is a key risk. If it comes in too high, you're not going to get the sales volume. Um, copycat products is more of a risk, obviously, post-launch. Uh, and again, I won't talk too much about that. It's something, obviously, that will be covered more by Vicky. Um, barriers to enter the market. Um, technical feasibility is a key risk, obviously, in terms of is it actually going to work. On some products, obviously, that's just not an issue at all. Um, but on some, it's a, a key factor. Um, project funding. So this is related, in some ways, to the kind of product unit cost. But if we get to a point in the project where actually the tooling cost is too high and it can't go forward, then that's obviously hugely disappointing for everyone. Um, and we'll talk about how we run a project to ensure that actually you, you have a, a reasonably accurate cost in terms of the tooling early in the project. Um, and then obviously kind of final, fairly obvious one where will retailers stock the product. And I guess we're always quite surprised how slow people are to approach retailers to, to ask their feedback on the product. Um, obviously, depending on the product, it might not be retailers anyway, it might just be kind of direct sales to the end user. Um, but if it is going to retail, you know, we always feel it's worth approaching retailers and, and talking to them a little bit earlier in the process to ensure that actually um, it's something that they're prepared to stock and there isn't a fundamental issue with it. So having looked through those kind of key risks, some of them will, will or won't be appropriate to your product, obviously. Um, the key thing then really is to come up with a development strategy that tackles those risks at a minimum cost, a minimum time effort uh, until you can minimise those particular kind of key, key problems. And we'll skip on now then to talk about some of the, the stages and things that can be done in order to tackle those, those identified risks really. Uh, so obviously one thing that, that can be looked at um, is market research. Um, Again, we've worked with market research firms and market research documents um, over the last kind of three years that can vary in quality, really. Um, and I guess, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute, but I think the main thing with the market research really is that it presents final conclusions that are actually useful in terms of design. So rather than it being broad brush um, comments on the market, the direction of the market, I think what I mean by market research is more detailed analysis of what your key target customer is, what their key buying requirements are, um, and that kind of element. Um, again, patent searching and IP review, I'll talk about briefly from a design perspective. Um, concept exploration, multiple prototype, and ballpark costings are all going to come into this, this part of the talk. Um, so to hopefully jazz it up a little bit, there's a diagram. <laughs> and I guess the main thing from this diagram, there's a laser pointer on this somewhere, I think. Yeah, great. <laughs> Um, so the main thing from this diagram is that when assessing viability on a, on a product, it isn't really a straightforward linear process. So everything that, that we work on has a different um, approach in terms of this initial stage. So if we work on something that's really quite broad um, in terms of a concept, then we probably do some concept exploration work first, so some further sketch work, innovative thinking, seeing what we can come up with before then maybe saying, okay, well, we now need to, to do a patent search to, to assess where that stands from an IP perspective. Can we get a patent on it? Is there likely to be an infringement problem? Um, and, and likewise with, with the market research, really, you know, sometimes it might be, well, actually, you've made some assumptions about the market, but that needs to be validated before any real work can commence on the project. Whereas at other times, if the concept is still very broad, then it might be worth developing it a bit further before then going back and doing some a bit more targeted market research. Um, so yeah, I, I guess the, the one bit that does depend on having done some work beforehand really is, is the kind of ballpark costings. That's not something that's actually very easy to do until the concept obviously is relatively 
far developed. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit more as well. Um, so, yeah, and the key things really with the market research, packet, uh, market research phase really, I feel as a designer, is to clarify the design brief and, and provide much more direction to your design team about what's actually required um, by your target market. Um, and as I say, I work with, with various different market research firms and various different market research reports done by other design consultancies actually. Um, and I'm always surprised quite how broad they are. Um, and I would have thought whether you're developing a product in-house um, or actually you're looking to use outside agencies, the key really with the market research bit is to be very specific about who you're designing for and what they want. Uh, again, sounds like common sense, um, but you find that that generally doesn't happen um, when we're working on, on these projects. Um, I think the other thing, the other market research pieces that we have worked with that have been incredibly useful are things like competitor product analysis in terms of the key features that, that maybe their products have that, that your products at the moment doesn't, um, and ensuring that within those key features, if there are particular ones that are appealing to your target buyer, that obviously your product does something to address those. And if they're patented and protected by IP, it may not, might not be possible to do something directly um, in, in terms of duplicating those features, but, but if not, obviously that's something that's definitely kind of worth considering. Um, yeah, and I guess the other thing that comes out of the market research probably is the target price point. Um, I, again, we find that when people are launching into product development, um, that often they're making quite a lot of assumptions and they assume that they're right because they're in that industry potentially. Um, but we always find that actually through the market research um, phase, that some of those things are clarified and they can stand on them and say, actually, yeah, this is what we assumed, and it is right, it's backed up by statistical data, and that's great, that gives a lot more clarity. Um, but equally, we find that some people's assumptions are, are totally blown out of the water by doing some actual statistical feedback, and that's obviously worth doing early in the process as possible, really. Um, so, patent searching and IP review from a design perspective, um, I think the key thing really for, for us to know as designers is, you know, what, what do we have to avoid in terms of developing the concept, you know, what mechanisms, systems and things could we just not use because actually they've got granted valid patents on them, um, or potentially, you know, what do we have to design around? Um, we do occasionally get tasked to uh, design around existing patents. Um, and obviously that's important for us to, to clarify exactly what we need to do. And I think the key thing really is, is integration with your patent attorney and your designers at this stage. Um, I'm always surprised how some product designers seem to be able to develop a product and, and then say at the end of the process, oh, well, you may be able to get a patent, you might want to go and talk to someone about that. Um, and by that point, obviously, it's far too late to find something else that you then need to design around. Um, and I think a cohesive approach where attorneys um, and designers are involved together from early stages is, is very important. And often in terms of what we do, um, I am often pestering Vicky saying, hey, what do you think to this? <laughs> are we going to take this forward? What, what are the patent implications of this? Um, to ensure that it is, it is done in a sensible fashion and that IP is con considered from an early point. Um, so this is a bit that I get a bit more excited about. I guess the kind of concept exploration phase. So once some of that background stuff's been done, um, as part of the concept exploration, we're looking at all sorts of different things in terms of ergonomics, key functionality, different ways of doing things where maybe we can bring innovation in, um, assessing some competitor products. Um, ideally, as you can kind of vaguely see from these pictures down here, you know, we're, we're kind of building some lash-up models, trying some things. Um, again, we find that actually people tend to spend a minimum amount of time on this phase, but actually what, what comes out of this phase you're then going to put uh, heart and soul into taking forward, um, including quite a lot of development time and cost and everything. Uh, and we find that more time spent on this stage ensuring that we've covered all potential options and that we are actually taking something forward that, that everyone's agreed is the best concept is obviously kind of time and money well spent really um, further down the line. So this is just an example of a... Uh, uh, a, I'll explain what the product is actually because I show you some CAD renders and things further down the presentation. So, and this is a device that clicks onto the top of a, a, a mountain biker's helmet. Um, it's got accelerometers and things in there. And it records all the motion of the biker as they're going down a, a downhill mountain bike run. Um, it then uses that data and creates a animation that, and the biker in the animation is true to life in terms of the angles and, and tilt and all those kind of things. Um, and we were tasked basically with designing the housing to fit to a helmet 
um, for the electronics that the client had, had developed. And this is you know, part of our initial concept um, exploration phase, looking at various different attachment means, various different styling options, um, just in terms of reviewing all potential options going forward before then actually making a, an informed decision about the right one to, to spend some time and effort prototyping and developing. Um, so Mark 1 prototype, um, again, this is something that we, uh, as a design firm, tend to put much earlier in the process than a, a lot of design companies. Um, but the main reason for this, I feel, really, is that at the end of the day, if technical viability is a key risk to your product, uh, then really you want something tangible and physical as early as possible to prove or disprove um, whether it's going to work or not. Um, and also we find that actually the key jumps in, in terms of the, the development of the product come when people have got something they can actually hold, touch, play with. Um, and therefore, you know, we produce relatively rough Mark 1 prototypes quite early in the process. Um, it is a minimum cost approach, uh, so... <laughs> We will make stuff out of you know, gaffer tape and bits of wood and everything else just to get to a point where we have something that's dimensionally about right that we can try some kind of fundamentals on. Again, if it's a bit more technical product, then we probably will have to do some early stage CAD work and produce some rapid prototype parts and things in order to be able to do this. Uh, but again, I think a minimum cost approach until you've got something tangible is often the best way uh, for a product, particularly if you're trying to assess technical viability. Um, at this point, though, we would, we would focus on core functionality only. Um, and I've got a couple of examples. Here's a textile one, obviously. So this is a, a kid's rucksack, um, and yeah, eventually it turns into something like this. Uh, the idea of it is it looks like a jetpack. The kid can um, uh, kind of do make-believe and stuff with it, as well as carrying their school bags and things, uh, school books and things even. Um, but the main technical... Ooh, let me get back one. The main technical challenge, really, was can we make something that has 3D form and holds its 3D form... Um, without needing tooling. So the client was quite, quite clear. They didn't want to spend thousands of pounds producing foam compression moulds or anything else. It had to be done without tooling, um, and so that was the challenge. Um, and this is our, our kind of process for doing that. Again, we're not using computer-aided design or spending a lot of time in sketch work at this point because there isn't any point. At the end of the day, it's going to have to be sewn and made, and so you know, we try and sew and make something that, that has some 3D form. Um, and this was the first prototype. Um, as you can see, there, there isn't any detail, there's no patterns or anything else. It's literally just the, kind of the core bits um, to ensure that we can do it. Uh, in the end, with this one, actually, we used um, boning from bras and cor corsetry to create the 3D form. Um, and, and yeah, once we proved that, only at that point, really, did we then look at the, the overall look and style and finish. Um, and this one here is, is going to get closer to the final thing, really. Uh, another example here, so this is the helmet mounted um, motion tracking device that I mentioned previously. So this is the first prototype of that, this is a rapid prototype. Um, interesting about this rapid prototype part is it's built from the CAD model, uh, but it's actually a rapid prototype with a hard plastic button and then soft rubber in the same process. So effectively we're replicating over moulding. Um, and you know, we have got some detail there in terms of reducing some of the wall thicknesses and things, but predominantly that is just a, a relatively uh, quick process to get to something 3D that we can house the electronics. This is an off-the-shelf um, battery enclosure. So we just house the electronics. It can be tried. It can be put on various different helmet types, taken down various different mountain bike runs. Any kind of core issues uh, can be identified from that. Actually, the core issue that came out of that testing was that these arms were just too weak in rubber, um, and we redesigned the whole thing so that this plastic battery housing also kind of comes into the arms and provides much more rigidity. Uh, and again, you know, that was quite a fundamental change to the overall approach, um, but until we had something we actually went and tried, it was difficult to, to assess that. Um, ignore that image, that's just a render. We'll talk about rendering later on. Uh, another example there, different product. This is a calf muscle exercising device for rehabilitation. Uh, and again, it, it's a rapid um, prototyping process. Uh, it's not something that's comfortable. It's not something you'd want to... Um, try and go out and sell, but it does prove the core functionality before we then go into all the other, other niceties after that, really. Okay, so ballpark costing, and this is something that, um, this is a service that actually we've developed over the last 12 months, so traditionally uh, a designer would do a whole of computer-aided design work, maybe three or four prototypes, <laughs> then take it to a manufacturer, 
Um, and then if the cost came in too high at that point, say, oh, well, never mind, terribly sorry you spent all this money, um, which isn't something that, that we uh, particularly like, and therefore we've developed now um, existing manufacturing relationships where we, have, we work with several manufacturers who will provide ballpark costings relatively early on. Now, depending on the product, um, some development work does need to be done. So something like the rucksack, for example, obviously we're going to have to have a Mark I prototype of a reasonable level before we can start to cost it. Um, and if it's something that's injection molded, we will need kind of rough CAD um, models and things so that we can, that's dimensionally okay to ensure that we can get some prices back from the manufacturers. Um, but I mean, we tried some various traditional design industry models previously, things like um, you know, working on ratios, so this part's going to be roughly this volume, therefore it's going to be roughly this cost in production. We've just found that none of those approaches really work very well. Uh, and so instead, what we'd far rather do is actually be in front of manufacturers who are generally providing a, a quote early on in the process. Um, great. Okay. So that's really looked at the key risks. That's gone through the various different things that can be done to assess some of those key risks. Um, and now we'll get on to, and talk about actually the kind of product design and development process a little bit. Um, so there's another diagram for this bit. Um, and I guess the thing I wanted to highlight really from this, this diagram uh, is that, again, it is a little bit of a fluid process. It's not as strictly linear. We do this, then we do this, then we do this. There's various different bits and pieces uh, that kind of come in. Uh, and this kind of circular arrow arrangement here <laughs> um, is actually very true to life in terms of the Stuart Golf product in that we produced a Mark I prototype. A whole lot of changes came out of that. Further CAD work needed a Mark II prototype. You know, by the time we've seen the Mark II prototype, some of the things we've done actually were proved not to be an improvement and that we needed to go back and, and go back to the original. And other things came out that then needed to be changed. Um, and I think, uh, again, we, we try to take a minimum cost approach on that. So actually, if we can change core parts of the prototype but not the whole thing to prove certain things, then obviously we will do. Um, but this, this bit of the process particularly is a little bit... Um, Try know is not quite the right word, really, but it does sometimes feel part of that process. You're going kind of two steps forward, three steps back kind of thing. Uh, but equally, it is adding value all the time in terms of the end product for the user. Uh, and the other thing that comes in quite a lot in this process is standards. Uh, we work very closely with a test house. And I'd always recommend, if you're developing something that's going to have to go through certification, that a test house is involved. Uh, and again, we try and involve a test house very, very early. So we work with a company called SGS. Uh, and they actually review quite a lot of our concepts at quite an early stage to ensure there's nothing fundamental that they see as a problem in terms of going through standards and testing. So they've just reviewed a Moses basket that we're working on at the moment, uh, two different options for the handle arrangement, um, and after a bit of, uh, kind of back and forth with them, it became quite clear that one of them probably wasn't going to get through the standards, and therefore, obviously, we've, we've gone with the other concept. But again, very good to establish that early before you then spend a lot of money on prototyping. Um, so this is the kind of overall approach we talked about viability already, um, and now we're going to touch on kind of product development, quickly on kind of testing and validation, a little bit on, uh, well, I'm going to leave the IP bit to Vicky, actually, and then quickly through manufacture. So this is how we might kind of start a project, really. Um, so some styling direction, concept sketch work in terms of what it might look like. Um, but we're quite practical in that, in that we don't really see any point coming up with some beautiful curvy shapes that actually then aren't going to fit the core mechanism. So as part of this early concept development phase, we would also be looking at the mechanical arrangement, ensuring that what we're sketching will fit what has to go in it. Uh, again, seems like common sense. Um, oh, this, is a, this is an example I wanted to kind of highlight. This isn't the product that we've designed, but we are working at the moment on a seat stick like this for shooting. Um, and we picked up the, the work from another agency. Uh, because the client spent about kind of 12 to 14,000 pounds on a detailed CAD model, full set of engineering drawings for every component part. Um, but we felt that fundamentally two of the things he wanted to do didn't work. Um, and so we did an initial development phase. We built some rapid prototype parts from an early CAD model uh, and proved that the fundamental concept didn't work. And effectively now what we've had to do is go right back to scratch. There isn't anything really on that CAD model that we can use. And all that kind of 12, 14,000 pounds and six months of development is basically worthless. <laughs> so I guess it just, um, just highlights the point, really, that early stage prototyping to prove technical viability 
um, is, is an obvious way to do things. This is some of the CAD development of the sensor project that I talked about earlier. So initial kind of rough CAD to get dimensions and kind of key housings in place. Um, and then through to uh, kind of initial renderings, textures, finish, color choices. Um, and then this is obviously a bit more final with the kind of logo and branding and things on. Um, which is a key point again, really, we work with branding agencies quite early in the process to ensure that what we're doing product-wise fits with the brand um, that the customer's taking forward, not just in terms of kind of logos and logo position, but also if the brand is all about robust, durable product, then we want to make sure, obviously, that the product looks that in inherently in terms of its design. So another kind of CAD model showing some of the detail mechanisms. Um, but the key thing from from computer-aided design, I think, is to appreciate that actually computer-aided design can be quite rough. Um, it doesn't necessarily feel like it ought to be and that it's all obviously tied down dimensionally in, in 3D. Um, but we go through probably three CAD stages with most products, kind of CAD for visualization, which is that initial dimensionally correct, roughly right CAD work to approve the overall look, feel. That gives you images that you can maybe take to retailers or buyers or focus groups to get, get feedback. Um, and it also gives you the ballpark costings potentially and only when all of those things have been assessed fully would we then go into detailed CAD for prototyping like this CAD model where all the kind of detail of, um, of internal mechanisms and things is defined and obviously the kind of final stages are a CAD for manufacture where we're looking at much more production details, draft angles and all those kind of things. It's an example of a couple of computer uh, photorealistic renderings uh, for a bike light product this was launched at the, at the Gadget Show. It hasn't been through prototyping or anything else. This is literally CAD for visualization. There's very little internals in there other than enough to know that if we have to, we can get the internals in there without fundamentally changing the shape or, or size. Um, and those images were basically used to assess the feedback from, from the Gadget Show uh, to ensure that it was something that, that people wanted and was worth taking forward. Just some photorealistic renderings, including in-context renders of the uh, sensor product. Uh, and there's one of a kind of tablet holder. Again, this, we took this to the gadget show uh, with these kind of renderings and an, uh, a Mark II prototype uh, to assess what people thought and felt to the product. What came out of that uh, user feedback, uh, I guess, from that event was that actually people felt there was quite a need for this in the educational market and particularly in special needs, and so that's something we've been able to explore a bit further and tweak the design to suit that particular market. Let's, get, um, let's have a quick look at some of these. This is a nice example, actually. Um, the client originally went directly to their Chinese manufacturer. They already made hairbrushes. Went to the Chinese manufacturer and asked to develop a hairbrush that had um, some more flexibility in it. So this has got an elastomer layer in the middle that allows the hairbrush to twist. In theory, it means that if you hit a knot as you're brushing tangled hair, um, it's a bit more comfortable because you get a bit of warning in the flex of the hairbrush before you pull really hard. Um, in this industry, I'm sure you'd appreciate it's quite a lot of marketing spin and image, so the client wasn't too concerned about how well that worked, but he wanted to demonstrate that it did have uh, some ability to twist and flex. So our first stage really, um, no, sorry, I'll go back a bit. So the Chinese produced this prototype, sent it through to him. It was a beautiful, stunning prototype, um, but had no flexibility at all and didn't work fundamentally. Um, so that was his initial £3,000 of budget basically down the drain. Um, whereas we started with £300 basically to make something out of plywood and a bit of um, elastomer that we had floating around the office, um, some bristles out of an old hairbrush to get to a point of proving that the core concept was, was doable. Um, that also actually told us things like what sure hardness we needed to use for this rubber section. Uh, the next thing we did was produce a rapid prototype. Again, this is simulating overmolding, so it's hard plastic sections with, over -mold, uh, with rapid prototyped elastomer sections as well. You can see all the bristles are broken off. Unfortunately, rapid prototyping isn't always great in terms of durability and robustness. So it wasn't something we could put through the hair at that point, but it was something we could test the fundamental flex and twist on the handle of the hairbrush. This is the next stage prototype which is all vac cast, so this could be used to the hair, proving that actually it is, is more comfortable, works well, um, that the handle shape's right, all that kind of thing. And this finally is, is one of the production samples. Um, so it's still actually a, a relatively rapid process. Um, from working in industry, you'd normally expect to go through eight or nine prototypes before a production model, whereas we tend to try and get it down to about four. But the way we do that is being quite clear about what we're assessing at each stage to ensure that all the fundamentals are covered really um, and that therefore we can actually progress the project quite rapidly. 
Uh, another example here of a set of salad tongs, uh, hopefully be on the market in a couple of months' time, just finishing off um, the Mark III sample at the moment. Um, so this was the initial prototype here, uh, produced actually by another agency with three tongs, three claws even. Uh, that proved to not be as effective actually as four, which was proven through this prototype. And then we refined it further in, in this one here. Um, the key differences between these two are the shape and size of the handle, so we won't get enough movement from this one. So this is slightly larger. The, the pole has actually gone down in terms of diameter, just in terms of look, really, making it look a bit lighter. And this is then actually the manufacturing sample. Um, this is a kind of final example of this, really. This is the initial Mark I prototype produced from a relatively rough CAD model. Once the client tried it, they realised that actually, uh, sorry, explain what it is. <laughs> uh, it goes on the corner of a skip so that you don't damage your head if you accidentally fall into it or any other part of your body. Um, it had reflectors on it initially, uh, obviously for higher visibility for cars. But once the client tried that, realised that actually he wanted it to be lit. So this one's got some electronics in it and some uh, LED lighting. Uh, the change from this prototype to this prototype is predominantly about this angle. So it it is magnetised onto the edge of the skip um, and we found that with the, this angle on the side it's just a bit too easy for someone who's a bit drunk on the way home from a pub to just pull it off. So we changed the angle so that actually it's a lot harder to do that. Um, we also changed the materials. This is a hard rapid prototype which is a lot cheaper to produce than this one which is a flexible elastomer prototype. So we produced that in hard material first, again keeping the client cost down to prove the functionality before then investing in this level of prototype. And this is the switch really into production. So all the branding and logos gone on it, and this is just about reducing the thickness for the moulding, really. Just a couple of examples of presentation prototypes there as well. Um, so I'm running out of time, so I'll skip through this relatively rapidly. This is the point really in the process where you start to do some testing and validation. That's probably market testing as well as any certification um, and checking uh, things like production samples. Um, so this is a sell sheet that we produced again to test the um, marketability of this product with retailers before he invested in tooling and production. Again, another sell sheet to gain retail feedback before going into production. Um, and this really is just to highlight, again, the integrated approach with branding. So with the hairbrush product, although functionality, we proved all of that, the key thing really in this market is the packaging, the brand, the look, the feel. Um, and actually our branding company was involved with this. Once the core functionality was proven that we had something, we were onto something, they were involved from that point to ensure that actually the design, the branding and everything was all cohesive. Um, so just kind of roughly skipping through the production process that we go through from there. CAD for manufacture, tweaking it, making it easier, lighter, um, easier to assemble. Pre-production prototypes, potentially at that point, mo soft mold tools to produce prototypes as opposed to using rapid prototyping. Uh, one of the disadvantages of rapid prototyping is you can make anything with it that then isn't manufacturable. So at this point, we potentially look at silicon mold tools and things to ensure um, manufacturability of the parts. And obviously through tooling with the manufacturer, um, sampling. I don't know how many samples you've been through with the golf trolley. <laughs> Seven or eight, yeah. So I, I guess we minimize, uh, we'd expect a minimum of, kind of two, three rounds of sampling, but um, as Mark's demonstrating, go up to kind of seven or eight. Sorry, I wasn't going to do that. Um, and then manufacture the first batch, obviously, and then testing the certification. It's just some <coughs> images of tooling, basically, in production. Uh, samples of a product that sits inside a motorbike sleeve to vent air up the motorcycle sleeve um, if you're riding in the summer. Um, we went through... I think four different samples with that just to get the, the exact flexibility on that clip that we wanted to fit a range of motorcycle jackets. Um, interesting with this one actually, the manufacturer couldn't put it together um, and the client took uh, a couple of his sons down to the manufacturer and showed them how, to, how it was meant to be put together and demonstrated that it could be done in under 20 seconds, um, which is kind of an example I guess of the client getting quite involved with the manufacturer at that point. Um, and then just quickly, because I don't want to take too much time away from Vicky's talk, just quickly touching on the value of product design. So some of the um, key uh, obvious benefits, really, gaining improved product sales and market share. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that in your talk a bit. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, gaining a competitive advantage. I guess one example of gaining a competitive advantage would be Apple. So rather than just, print, just competing on price all the time, actually to come up with something that, that changes <coughs> the whole market totally um, through innovation. 
Uh, reduction in unit cost, that's something we looked at a lot with the Stuart Golf Project. Uh, how can we get from this thing that's, uh, I don't know, maybe have 50 components to kind of fewer components? How can we improve assembly um, and get something that actually is, is cheaper to manufacture? Um, the next, products, the next points are probably pretty obvious, really. Uh, again, also product design can be used to increase the product range. So we often find actually in the concept exploration phase that we come up with I don't know, five or six different concepts. The client says, well, that one's truest to the one I want to take forward, but also I like that one, and that would make quite a nice addition in terms of a budget option or a more expensive option for the range. Um, and obviously, continual product improvement does improve customer loyalty. There's a few uh, slightly less obvious benefits. Um, designer who talks about today often leads to IP, which is a tangible value in terms of your company balance sheet. And we've also worked with companies who are looking to um, improve the saleability of their business, uh, whereby maybe they're investing it in different levels of product development across five or six different products. So actually then to investors, they can go back and say, look at what everything we've got in our pipeline that's coming to market. Um, you know, obviously, you're going to want to buy this business, aren't you, kind of thing. Um, the sales enabler thing comes up quite a lot, so we find that marketing and sales guys are saying we really want this company to develop a new product because actually we want something to go back to buyers and get excited about uh, and go back to kind of uh, to retailers who maybe don't stock our products at the moment and, and show them something new. Um, opening up foreign markets, so we were working with an international uh, guillotine and, and trimmer manufacturer um, who specifically wanted to improve their market share in Germany. And so we were using customer feedback from their German market to improve the product for that market and therefore gain sales. Um, interestingly, at the moment, we're doing a product uh, development for a major beer brand that is all about PR. They're never actually going to take the product through to market at all. It is just a PR exercise. So they want to develop this product and sell it as an exclusive to a particular national newspaper um, and the rest of the images to other other national newspapers as well, just to generate brand awareness. Um, it's the first time we've done a product around that, but it's also interesting that if you are developing new products, there's a quite a lot of good PR that you can get around that, and there's a, a kind of good public mood in, in terms of interest in it. Um, and then, obviously, the last two, really, about kind of adding to your, your brand value. Um, so just to summarise then quickly, um, my feeling really is that Effective planning at the outset is absolutely key. So as we talked about, identifying key risks, formulating a develop plan, development plan that tackles those key risks early, um, and then certainly advocate an integrated approach where attorneys, branding um, experts, retailers, focus groups are all an integrated part of the process to ensure that actually what you get out the end um, is cohesively developed um, and hopefully will take the market by storm. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. Um, I'm going to hand over to Vicky.